Good morning and welcome to this episode of Refill with Randy. Grab your favorite cup, fill it up, and let's start this day right together. part of last week, uh, we discovered that there was a pin-sized hole in one of the pipes leading into our hot water heater. And it was spraying mist out. We knew we needed to take care of it. Uh, a friend came over and we thought we'd be able to fix it with uh, a piece of rubber clamped on. The rubber would, you know, fit into that little hole and it worked but for a couple of days then it started to leak worse well he talked to a friend found out he needed a a better grade of rubber and so he he got a piece he came back and once again uh fixed it this time it held but now last night we noticed it was leaking again, this time not in that hole, but actually about two inches away from where the original leak was. Uh, we were trying to put band-aids on an artery, basically, because there was much more of the pipe that needed to be replaced. And thankfully, yet another friend came by today and replaced not the six inches that we thought we might have to replace, but actually like 10 foot. And uh, thanks to uh, technology like shark bites and the fact that he had the skills and the tool and was willing to give the time uh, it's now fixed but you know sometimes in our spiritual life I, I think we do the same thing I think we start to to see a leak I think we start to notice that there's something off you know we we've done something that has kind of rocked the boat and there's a little more gap between us and God. And we think we can just fix it easy. But it's bigger than what we think. And, and so we try other things to fix it. And that actually makes it worse. And it's not until we're willing to confess our sin and uh, repent fully. You know, replace all of that behavior with godly behavior that's when uh, we can actually, again, start working the way that we're supposed to. That's when God can use us as willing vessels. It makes me think of um, the story back in 2 Samuel 11. And when I say story, uh, I don't mean fairy tale. I'm talking about a biblical account. And it's of David and Bathsheba. And you may know many of the details, but it starts off by saying that uh, when everyone else was at war, when kings were supposed to be at war, David stayed home. And you start to see a, a pin-sized leak happening in his relationship with God. And as he stayed home, he got idle and he started to look where he shouldn't have been looking. And he sees this beautiful woman bathing, and he lusts after her. He abuses his authority as king, has her brought up. He lies with her. And just when he thinks, well, you know, everything's fine. It was one little incident. Word comes back, she's pregnant. Now, he had all sorts of wives, all sorts of concubines. He could have had anyone, and yet he chose to lay with this woman. And if that wasn't bad enough, this woman was married. In fact, her husband, Uriah the Hittite, uh, he fought for David. You know, when David was home, he was actually at war. 
And David, he quickly tried to scheme, you know, how could he fix this leak? And the way he thought to fix it was to simply cover it up. He thought, if I can get Uriah to come home and lay with his wife, then everyone will just assume that it's his child. No one will be any the wiser. We'll be good to go. So he brings uh, Uriah back. But Uriah, he refuses to go in and lay with his wife. You know, he's in the mindset of a military man. And he's not going to um, think about civilian things or even marriage things at this point. You know, he, he is keeping his mind on the war at hand. And no matter what David tried to convince him, uh, he would not do it. And so then David got a different piece of, of rubber, if you would, to, uh, to cover it up. And basically what he did was uh, he sent a message and he sent it with Uriah which was um, even worse because it shows that Uriah was uh, loyal to David. He never opened the message and read it for himself, but, but Uriah brought it and, it and it told the person that uh, when they were in the heat of the battle, you know, that it is, is they send everybody up in the front line, uh, draw back except for Uriah. In other words, uh, he was putting him in a position where he would get killed. Now, again, that right there would be bad enough. And he went through that plan and it worked. And when the man came back and he reported, not just Uriah, but, but many had died because of the choice that David had made. You know, lots of times when we sin, we think it's small, we think it's something that we can just cover up and it goes away. But there's always collateral damage. There's always others that get hurt by it. There's always God who is hurt by it. There's no such thing as, um, you know, the sin that we're only hurting ourselves. That's a myth. We are hurting ourselves, but we're also hurting our relationships. We're hurting our relationship with God. And that's exactly what David had done. You know, he thought that it was over now. So he tried to do the, the right thing, and he took Bathsheba as his wife, and she had the baby. But God knew, and he was upset with David. And so uh, when you turn over to the next chapter, 2 Samuel 12, we find the prophet Nathan coming and confronting David. And he does this in a, a very unique way. He approaches David, and he says, uh, O king, I come to you with a situation. There's a man who has all sorts of sheep, all sorts of cattle. He's very, very wealthy. And next to him, his neighbor is a man of little means. In fact, he only has one little ewe lamb, and it's more like a pet to him. You know, he treats it like a child. It eats at his table. But when this rich man had people over, and it came time for dinner. Rather than taking one of the many in his flock, he took that man's one little lamb, and that's what they had for dinner. And, and as David is hearing the story, his blood is beginning to boil. You know, the um, you know righteous indignation that he has. You know, how could someone do something so horrible? You know, that man deserves to die, and that's when... Nathan points at him and he says, you are that man. And all of a sudden, the conviction of the Holy Spirit, it took David down a notch. And you know, David's known as a man after God's own heart. And it's not because he was perfect, obviously. In fact, if you were just comparing sins, he probably hit much lower than most of us. But the fact of the matter is, he sinned in any sin, whether it's a little white lie or whether it's murder and adultery, it separates you from God. And we can't get across that separation. We can't get across that gap on our own without Jesus. Well, for David, he didn't want that gap to be there. You know, he wanted to make things right with God. He could have 
denied it. He could have, you know, lashed out in defense. There are certainly many other kings who did something like that. You know, Saul. Saul did something that most people would think, well, that's nothing compared to what David did. And yet it was the attitude of his heart and that he thought that he was right uh, above God. That's what the problem was. And yet David, he humbled himself. He confessed the sin and he repented. And there were still consequences. You know, unfortunately, even when we're forgiven, there are still consequences that linger on. You know, sometimes it's a matter of broken trust that never gets repaired. Sometimes uh, it's going to jail. If you've done something that, that is deserving of that, for David, his son died. You know, it was a high price to pay. But if we um, sense that there's a leak in our relationship, you know what, don't just try to cover it up. Don't just try and do the, the minimal amount of maintenance to, to try to keep it going. Sometimes you gotta replace all 10 foot of pipe. You know, sometimes you, you've gotta go the distance and it takes work and it takes humility. And it takes praying to God and asking for forgiveness. And scripture says, because of what Jesus did on the cross, because he died for our sins, for our sake, because he rose again three days later, that we can be forgiven. We are able and he is willing. And so even today, um, as you think about your relationship with God, is there anything that you need to get right with him? You know, better to go to him first rather than a Nathan coming to you. You know, it says all of our dirty deeds, they're, they're going to be brought out into the light eventually. If not in this life, when we stand before Jesus, how much better to go to him on our own and say, Lord, forgive me and help me. I don't want to live like this. I don't want to continue in this uh, uh, mode of sin. I don't want to continue to, to justify my actions or my addictions. Uh, I want to get right with you. I want to get right with others. And I want to be forgiven. That's where David was. And so what I'd like to do is uh, just close by reading the prayer that David wrote after this time. It's Psalm 51. It's beautifully written. And it shows you, again, the heart that David has. He doesn't want God to um, banish him. He doesn't want the spirit to be taken from him because he knows then he won't know what's right or wrong. You know, he wants to be convicted because he ultimately wants to obey his father. This is what he prays. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions, wash away all my iniquity, cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Yet you desired faithfulness even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in that secret place. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. And then I will teach transgressors your ways so that sinners will turn back to you. If you spend time today in prayer with the Lord, just allow his spirit to search your heart. It, it can be scary because there are things that we would like to forget. There are feelings of, of guilt and shame that you know we don't want to remember and we don't want to experience again and yet 
there cannot be true healing until Christ can take away that pain, take away that guilt that that sin has caused and replace it with his healing that took place on the cross. To repair that distance between us and God, to stand in the gap for our behalf. And so today, as you confess, as you repent, as God gives you um, sorrow that leads to repentance. I pray that on the other side, as he gives you that new spirit, one that is loyal to God, I pray that the Holy Spirit would guide your every step. I pray that you would obey him that much more. I pray that rather than walking around under the burden of guilt and shame, that you would be free, not free to sin again, but free to live a life without going back to that sin and free to serve Christ each and every day. I pray God's blessing upon you all. Have a great day.